All right, if you have a Bible tonight, let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. We'll look at two places here, and I'll give you time to read a little while before we get in the message. And you want Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16. Now, there's something that goes on along with this chapter. It's in the next chapter. The next chapter, chapter 21, if you want something that will explain this chapter... In chapter 21, at verse 28, uh, Matthew 21, 28, you'll find Jesus giving a parable there to his audience, like he often does. And he said in the past, a certain man had two sons, and instead of this time saying, the younger said, and talking about the parable, he said he sent these boys into the field. And he said he had these two boys, and he said, uh, he said to one boy, he said, son, he said, go to work today in my vineyard. Go to work today in my vineyard. And this boy says, sir, I go. And then he didn't go. And then he said, the second boy, he said, boy, he said, go to work today in my vineyard. And the boy said, I ain't going. But later, later he changed his mind and he went. And then Christ asked his audience a, a perfectly uh, reasonable question. He says, which of the twain did the will of the father? And the answer, of course, the fellow who said, I ain't going. The one that did the will of the Father was one that said, I will not go, and then after repented and went. And obviously, the one that didn't do the will of the Father is the one that said, sir, I go, and then didn't go. All right, now come down to chapter 20, and I'll give you a little while to read there. And chapter 20, you want to read uh, in there, you want to read uh, verse 1 to 16. Verse 1 to 16. Verse 1 to 16. Just give you a little time to read it. Now you see what happened there. He had a vineyard again. He went out to get workers and laborers to go in the vineyard. And it went early in the morning. And it went early in the morning and uh, got a bunch of them out there and uh, said, uh, go to work today in the vineyard. And they said, uh, what did he give me? He said, what is right, that I'll give thee. That's the conditions of the employment. What is right, that I'll give thee. You see, sir, the Bible is capitalistic. There's no union there to, to, to get your time and a half over time, unemployment, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the fellow says, you go to work, you all go to work, okay, you and me reach the agreement. What's the agreement? Of what is right, that I'll pay thee. That's what you get. It's an unstipulated amount. So I'll give you what's right. If you trust the employee, you go to work for him. If he says he would give you what's right, you go for what's right. You take in the Bible to have a great deal more capitalism than we do in America today. One time I read in my Bible someplace there where... Lord Jesus Christ uh, died and buried and rose from the dead. When he came back up, he talked with his disciples and sent them out to preach and fellowship and set up a church, which they did. And one day in that church, they got sharing wealth, wealth sharing. <laughs> and they got selling what they had and dividing up. And a fellow named Ananias came in there and pretended like he'd sold everything he had when he hadn't done it. And his crime wasn't that he didn't tie. That wasn't it. And his crime wasn't that he hadn't given all of it. That wasn't it. His crime was that he made people thought, think he'd give all of it, and he hadn't give all of it. He was a spiritual pretender. And you know what Peter says about that fellow? He says, before you sold it, wasn't it yours? And after you sold it, wasn't it your power? You haven't got that power. There's anybody in this building put an ad in the paper and say, I want to sell my home to a Protestant male with a wife and two children. You can't put it in the, the newspaper, won't take it. You say, why? It ain't yours to sell. They'll tell you how you can sell it and who you can sell it to. You can't put up a motel out here and say, this motel is for just married people or single males or single women. We don't want any male couples in here or female couples in here. We don't want any queers in here. We don't want any lesbians in here. We don't want any some queers in this place. This is just for folks that live straight. You can't do it. You say, why can't the motel isn't yours? You know what belongs to it? It belongs to the federal government. You don't believe me? Go out and try to put it up. What you getting so quiet for? Some of you people, you've been watching the boob tube for so long, you're getting the bubble head. You're watching the bubble box, your, your mind goes bloop, 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 bloop. You know what's going on. You've got more capitalism in the Bible than you do in America today. Oh, now that pastor there that went out to work. I heard a colored preacher preach this one time. And you get a sure enough saved black preacher. Now, most of them are communists. You know that, don't you? Most of them are communists, and the rest of them are charismatics. 
But every now and then you get a black preacher who's really saved and born again and believes the book, like old John Wesley Grant. I preach with him in two or three meetings. And they get a, they get a look at scripture a white man can't get. Anytime you think colored folks like white folks, it means you haven't been listening to preaching. You listen to black preachers. He can get things out that a white man can't get. I mean, I've heard him preach, man. I heard one of preaching the prodigal son one time. I was in, I was in Cincinnati. Uh, in a meeting, and when you get up in the morning, the uh, motel, or Sunday morning before you go to preach, you always try to get kind of jacked up. And so you turn on the TV, you know, to try to get a, a, a t- television program, kind of get you jacked up. And trying to find a spiritual TV program Sunday morning is trying to like find a whisper in a hurricane, man. <laughs> and I got up there one morning, threw that thing in, and all of a sudden I got some black preacher, and boy, if he wasn't going, man, he was talking about the product, he talking about the elder brother. And he said, now the elder brother come to his daddy and he said, daddy, he said, how come you never made a feast in your house for my friends? And he said, well, in the first place, maybe the elder brother had the kind of friends that wouldn't enjoy a meal in the father's house. <laughs> but he said, you see, you can pick your friend, but you can't pick your family. And he said, now he said, uh, when that boy came home, the elder brother wouldn't even call him brother. He said, your son. He denied his own family. He said, you can't pick your family, you pick your friends. But if I was the same family with you, I was your brother. And if you may not like me, but we're in the same family. <laughs> Amen, brother. He's putting on them. He said, maybe that other brother never asked the father for a feast in his house. You ever think about that? I mean, they got some stuff. I heard Wesley Grant preach one time. He was preaching on Jonah. And he said, that, and, and a disobedient prophet was on that ship. And he said, uh, they don't know what the cause of this trouble is with us. And Jonah says, I'll tell you, I was the trouble. I was a disobedient prophet, and I was running from the Lord. And they said, what are we going to do about it? And he said, well, the only way you can get rid of this mess is get rid of me. He said, you've got to throw me over. And the best about that time, he said, uh, they knew they had to do something because the Lord said, north wind, you blow south, and south wind, you blow north, and east wind, you blow west, and west wind, you blow east and get together in a cooperating kind of a way. <laughs> and he said, so they pick up that uh, disobedient prophet, they said, that backslidden preacher, and they said, I'm sorry, preacher, but you got to go. <laughs> and he said, threw him over the side of that boat, he said, but about that time the Lord picked him out a great big fish and said, hey, man, there's a certain... <laughs> he said, I can hear this, you know. Sometimes I think maybe this is what the Lord has said that, you know, you know. I heard a hillbilly preacher preach now in, in, in uh, Solid Rock Baptist Church in Florida one time. He said, when they came to the tomb, they said, the angel, where is he? And the angel said, he ain't here. <laughs> <laughs> I can still hear that. He ain't here. Well, I think, I think that's what must the original Greek must say. He must have. <laughs> I think the Lord sent an uneducated angel down to talk to him. <laughs> is he here? He ain't here. <laughs> And he said, he said, he said, he called that fish over there and said, hey man, there's a certain ship what I want to have you swim in the whereabouts thereof. <laughs> I had a preacher one time preaching this thing here, preaching on this, uh, this, uh, uh, in the vineyard and working. He said, he went out in the morning, he said, I hired him early in the morning, went out about noon, got some at noon, he got the rest of them late in the afternoon. And it's about the time they was going to come in and get the pay, he said, he done and paid them all off the same way. And he said, when they pay him off all the same way, he said, there's all kinds of fussing going on. And he said, what's the matter? He said, well, hey, man, so this cat here, he done come in the last hour and work, and I've been working out here in the hot sun all day long, and how come you done paid him off the same way you paid me? And he said, well, he says, it's my money. I do what I want to want my own money, can I? He said, you see, the moral of this parable is here, that it don't make no difference what time you went to work. The question is, is you on the job. <laughs> I never got that out of that parable. I read that parable a hundred, a hundred and twenty-four times, and I never got that out of it, you know. But he said, the question is, you on the job. Now, I want to ask you something. He said, son, go today in my vineyard. And if you read that passage, you know what you read there? You said he went out about the sixth hour and found others standing out there. And you know what he said to him? He said, why stand you here idle all day? That's the question I want to ask you. Why stand ye idle all day? How come some of you haven't gone to work in the Lord's vineyard yet? Now listen, don't give me this stuff. Say, well, I'm not called to be a preacher and evangelist. Hey man, back in the old days, when a fellow was called, he had to be a preacher or an evangelist or a missionary or at least a Bible teacher, but not anymore. 
There are all kinds of things that God can do with people. There's all kinds of things God calls people to do. God can use bus drivers. He can use typists. He can use radio announcers. He can use airplane mechanics, auto mechanics. There's all kinds of a need. While you take over and overseas right now, you know what one of the greatest needs is? It's for people to start schools over there to teach missionary children in the schools. Are you just a school teacher? Just a school teacher? Are you a principal? Just a principal? Don't tell me you haven't been called. Don't into that stuff. Don't tell me that stuff. Don't say, well, no work for me out there in the vineyard. There's all kinds of work out in the vineyard. Did you know a fellow could start in Detroit, and if he passed out tracks and put out tracks in Detroit, one track in every home in Detroit, he'd never get the city covered? Because by the time he got them all covered, the population would change, and almost a quarter of the city have to go back to it again. What are you doing? Just sitting doing nothing. You pick up a telephone book. I know a lady is in the hospital, been sick for years and years. She gets in the telephone book. She dials about 50 numbers a day and just gives them the plan of salvation. She leads about two souls to Christ a day over the telephone. Well, I have been called a priest. Don't give me that stuff, okay? There's work. And the question is, how come you haven't gone to work yet? I've been out in the Lord's field now for 42 years. By the grace of God. When I say the grace of God, I mean the grace of God. Listen, when I got saved at 27 years old, you couldn't have convinced me I'd ever lived to be 40 years old. The way I live. The fellows like I live have no business living to be 40. Most fellows live like I live, wind up like John Belushi or John Lennon or Elvis Presley. I got thinking about the other day, if I'd stayed in the Army uh, coming up, I would have retired in 1974 as a 30-year man. I'm 17 years past retirement. 17 years past retirement. Lord said he gave me 30 years in the army, gave me 42 years in the, out there in the field working. I'm going to tell you something. It's been great. It's been a great trip. I wouldn't crave for anything. What's the trouble? Why stand you idle all day? I'm going to ask you some questions. First of all, is this the reason? Is the reason the pay? Isn't the pay any good? Is that why you haven't gone to work? Uh, you know, the average person in this country, they, they think they should earn at least $15 an hour. You Yankees are bad about that. You think if you're not making $12 an hour, you're in the poverty bracket or something or other. If you can't live in $12 an hour, blow your brains out and give somebody a break, okay? <laughs> amen, 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 amen. If you can't live in $12 an hour just because you're full of the devil and stuck in yourself and don't have a brain in your head, fella. That's your problem. Um, you take that Eastern Airlines, that bunch of all striking for money, they're making fourteen, fifteen, twenty dollars an hour, and close down the airlines, all lost the job. Good enough for them. Shut down some more. The thing is, you spoil. Did you ever work for twenty cents an hour? I work for twenty cents an hour. Cover surveyors lying right out there with a fellow working with the transit out in Kansas, twenty below zero, thirty below zero, and those hills out there by Outland and this place out there west of town. Twenty cents an hour, big money, boy. You know, I've got at home, I've got an ad for a job for a fellow in 1787. That's going back a while. You know what that job ad says? It says, wanted young man to work in the store 60 hours a week, six days a week, salary $7 a week, must fear God, be clean cut and shaven, and be able to lead the family in prayer and Bible reading, and must be a church attender. And you got it tough? <laughs> I bet some of you fellas wouldn't take that job, would you? You know, the thing back, the thing is, back in the old days, you know, uh, people worked. Uh, if any of you ever raised on a farm, and the farm work hadn't been as bad, hard as it used to be, but if you ever raised on a farm, you know what work is. And in a farm, uh, there's just work to do all the time. And I say, you know what, you know why kids get in so much trouble these days? I think we all know they got spare time. Fred Brown, he said, when I was a boy, he said, we get up at 6 o'clock in the morning or 5 in the morning, work all day. He said, I never saw a cow in daylight. <laughs> he said, I saw that cow before the sun came up or after the sun went down. And he said, out there in the oat field, you know, and, and baling oats and stuff. And he said, Dad, he said, why do we have to get up in the dark to get these oats? 
And he said, well, some of them are wild oats, and you have to sneak up on them. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, when he, and his buddy, when he and his buddy, you know, finished working about six o'clock at night, had supper at seven o'clock, the old man said, now, boy, if you want to go in town and have a good time, go ahead. <laughs> well, you said, Bush, you couldn't go up 30 feet, man. I said, you stay out of trouble. But you see, that's the old way of doing things. I'll never forget one time up in Swanboro, North Carolina, I met a fellow. I'd be one of the wisest men that ever lived. And he was a character. He was a character. That old boy, he, uh, he had two boys, and those boys got to be about, oh, about, uh, 15, 17. All he did, he bought them a farm. And bought them a farm, and of course he bought them a farm, he lost his shirt on the farm. I said, how long those boys run the farm? He said, they run about, uh, two years before they got in the army. I said, well, how'd the farm make out? He said, uh, they went broke. I said, how much money did you lose? He said, we lost about $12,000. And I said, well, that didn't work out too well, did it? He looked at me and kind of smiled and said, kept them off the street. <laughs> Old man wasn't dumb as they looked. First boy from 13 to 15, next boy from 17 to 21, kept them off the street. That didn't too much money to pay to keep to get off the street. The question is, what about the pay? Is the pay any good? Something wrong with the pay? You know, my first offering was, I cut my teeth in the ministry up in the hills of Carolina. I'd know, I'd know a North Carolina preacher anywhere. I'd know, if I got on the radio, I'd tell my wife, North Carolina. I can tell them. And I, all my preaching back in the West End of North Carolina, around the Indian Reservation back there, and the Blue Ridge and the Smokies back in there, and my first offering for a weekend meeting was $3.30. $3.30. And I came back and spread that money out on the little table in my trailer. I was so proud of that money. You say, why? It was the first money I ever got doing, first money I ever got for doing what God told me to do. Three dollars and thirty cents. Well, in that time, many, many a time since then, I've got a check into four figures for a, a revival meeting, a Bible, many times since then. But I, I never been more proud of it than that first bit of cash. I think I threw out on 30 cents just about paid for gasoline up there and back in the meal while I was there. But it was the first thing I got for doing what God told me to do. Preachers write me sometime, they say, roughly what's your minimum? I say, what do you mean minimum? <laughs> well, your minimum charge for holding a meeting. I said, I don't charge any minimum for holding a meeting. I said, get me up there and back. If you want to give me a hamburger, that'll be it. <laughs> if you can pay my way up there and back, whatever there is, that's it. You see, you see, is what, what is right that I'll give thee. Boy, the Lord must not have put much of my preaching when I first started. Three bucks and thirty cents, that's what you're worth, brother. I mean, that was sort of Saturday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. You know why some of you rascals aren't in the vineyard? Because you're afraid you'll get what you're worth. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Like one of those town dummies back then, one of those little old small town years and years ago, he came up to the blacksmith, and the blacksmith knew he was a dummy and thought he'd kid him. And he said, you going to work for me, Sam? He said, uh, I don't want to work for you, not. He said, well, come on. He said, I'll pay you what you're worth. And he said, you can't fool me. I ain't going to work for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's what God says to some of you. I'll pay you what you're worth, and you got good brains. You say, I ain't going to work for that. That's your problem. Now let me ask you this. Is this the problem? Maybe that ain't the problem. Maybe this is the problem. Is it reasonable work? Is that the problem? You think it's unreasonable? You know what the Bible says? It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your what? What? Again. You see, I make them say it over and over again because it's amazing how many times you read that stuff and not realize what you're reading. It said it's perfectly reasonable for you to give everything you got to Jesus Christ. Now, he gave everything he had for you. What's unreasonable about giving what you have for him? For it's unreasonable. That's not unreasonable. It's perfectly reasonable. One of the reasonable things you ever saw. Trouble is, uh, I don't know what the trouble is. He's a hard employer or something. Unreasonable work. Maybe just lazy. Maybe that's it. I heard of a bird watcher was so lazy he'd lie down and let the birds watch him. <laughs> 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 they said there's a fellow. 
they said a fellow, old cowboy lying out there in, in, in the sun, you know, and they said, uh, and he said, he said, uh, he said, he said, he said, uh, Jane, he said, why don't you go over and get in the shade? And he said, you can't fool me there, man. So I rolled the shade, put us in the sun, and be over there, and I'll be back in the sun again. <laughs> now, maybe that's the way it is for some of you. I wonder sometimes how many jobs you had, some of you people. You know, I'm, I'm no spring chicken. I mean, some men live faster than other men. And the years I live before I was saved, I know, I know what it's like to be a shipyard worker in the shipyard, AFL button, the whole thing, and drill the receptacles in the top, you know, the inside the ships. I played drums in a dance band. I played guitar in a dance band. I've been a disc jockey in radio, been a DI in hand to hand, paid a sign, the billboards for the cartoon for a newspaper. I've had some experience. And I think the most reasonable thing that I ever did was turn myself over to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. Something wrong with the employer? I work for all kinds of fellows. I work for radio program directors and, uh, and radio station managers, WAR, WKRG, WABC, WABB, WBRN. I work for fellows in dance bands. Buddy Pelham and his top rail wranglers. <laughs> the high class bunch, man. Nothing but the best. I mean, John King and his Gulf Coast serenaders. And Bill Hendricks, you know, is something else. I've worked for dance band fellas. Swing bands, dance band combos, and country western bands. Tut Yarborough and, uh, and, the, and Hal Harburg and Tut Yarborough and the Stardusters. Uh, Hal Harburg and the Cavaliers. Matt Benton and the Jayhawkers. 10-piece band, 14-piece band, 16-piece band. I know it's like that different kind of employers. I work for Uncle Sam. You work for Uncle Sam? I bet some of you are in the civil service right now, aren't you? You mean to tell me Uncle Sam's a better employer than Jesus Christ? I don't believe it. I've seen them come back from overseas. I mean, all eaten up without a brain, just as yellow as a... As a just yellow, just just as just, I get a, I should have had a chalk here. Just as yellow as that, except more yellow <laughs> from eating out of brain. And I've seen them come by that POE shipping out uh, back to the United States after being in the Bataan Death March and some of those terrible things in World War II. I've seen them come by there shaking and trembling and their nerves just shot and tore all the pieces. Been overseas forty four months. I've seen them stand there and cry and say, Lieutenant, I can't go back. I can't go back, Lieutenant. I can't go back. I said, sure, you can go back, man. Put your duffel bag in a two and a half ton truck. You go down to Pier 5. You can take off here in 30 minutes. I can't go back. I can't go back. I said, why not? I've been over here too long. I've been over here too long. They did that for Uncle Sam. I said, I paid him. You mean to tell me Jesus Christ not a better employer than that? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Years ago back there, I think about 1943 someplace, we had a terrible battle over near New Georgia. Oh, Cape Browser, I think it was called. There was one place there called Suicide Creek. They've been trying to get across for days and days, and, and they couldn't get across it. They're getting picked out by snipers every time they try to cross it. And finally they got a bulldozer out, and every time they put a guy in the bulldozer, the Japs would shoot him off the bulldozer. And the five the Japs counterattacked across that creek. When they came across that creek, they had some knee mortars and stuff going, and one young uh, Marine there, only been in, well, just, he was, got in, you know, 18, and was only about 18 and a half, and all that hell broke loose, and he was sitting there at a machine gun, the man next to him had part of his head torn off with a shell, and his helmet went back across what was left of his head, and that kid sitting there began to, he began to, to fake out, you know, he began to go, he began to lose contact with what was going on, face got just perfectly ashed, and he couldn't squeeze the trigger, and old gunny kneeling beside him there in the gun pit turned him and said, uh, I want you beefing for you getting paid for, ain't you? And that got him out of it. <laughs> See? But that's the truth. They paid you, didn't they? Sure they did. They paid you. Was it pretty good pay for the work? Was it a good employer? Let me tell you something. I've had all kinds of employers and all kinds of pay, and the best employer I ever had was Jesus Christ. And the best pay I ever got, I got from him. Amen. I don't know how it's been with you. You'll have to speak for yourself. But I've had them. I've had them. I've had all that stuff. 
And the best employer I ever had was Jesus Christ. And the best pay I ever got, I got from Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. Maybe this, maybe I haven't got the touchstone yet. Maybe I haven't yet put my finger in the thing in your life that's keeping you from going to the vineyard to serve the Lord. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's this, so. Uh, Maybe it's so uh, you don't think the work is important enough. Is that it? Is the reason why you don't get in the work is because you think that this thing about getting people saved and getting them in the Bible, maybe you don't think that's important? I don't, I don't know how you feel about those things. But if there's anything in this world more important than getting people saved and getting them uh, in the Word of God, I never found out what it is. That's the most important thing in the world. Years ago, there was a girl in uh, in uh, in a little old town in Virginia. Her name was uh, Sadie Thompson, and she was from Johnson Falls, West Virginia. And Johnson Falls, West Virginia, you can imagine what kind of place it was. And her daddy was the head of a livery stable, which was saying he was just bottom of crumb of society and worth nothing, and down there in the back of nowhere. And 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 uh, Sadie, uh, she always wanted to be accepted as kind of a social kind of person. She had refinement, Sadie Thompson did, both her daddy as a head of a livery stable, she couldn't get make much impress upon the society at Johnson Falls. And the big thing at Johnson Falls was the Laurel Literary Society. And the Laurel Literary Society was a, a little thing, a little intellectuals in Johnson Falls, you know. And to join the literary society you had to write a book. And of course she'd never written a book, but she saved up her money working for her daddy and other people, and she intended to write a book someday on my trip to Europe. <laughs> and then she get accepted as a member of the Laurel Literary Society. So she saved up her money, and she made a trip to Europe, and as God would have it, and she was saved, girl, and as God would have it, she got over there in August of 1914. In August of 1914 is the wrong time to take a trip to Europe. <laughs> Because that's when the crowds came through Belgium like a wildcat going to a paper bag. And old Sadie Thompson was out there on the Belgian border between Belgium and France when the crowds came through. And that driver, she was with, screamed and got out of his car and ran for his life. And the bombardment fell. She caught her in the middle of the bombardment. She got there terror stricken, didn't know what to do, and stood by that car with shells going over. And then the counterattack started, the shells going the other way. And then troops running by. And troops just staring at her and going on by and ignoring her, and then men getting shot, first thing in bodies. And when night came, she was out there running back and forth with many wounded soldiers she could find and tearing off strips of her dress and trying to bind up wounds and stuff and reaching down the ditch there and taking rainwater out and putting it in their mouths and saying, God bless you, God keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be merciful to you, you know, helping these folks. And boy, about midnight, a Belgian officer came through there. The Belgian had a temporary counterattack that uh, saved him for a while, and they almost shot her, and he said, what the blankety blank you doing out here, lady? And she said, I'm just trying to hold back hell. <laughs> and he said, well, it's a good thing you are, because everybody else turned it loose and went on through there. <laughs> and she stayed there in France and Belgium and worked there as a nurse and stuff, just volunteering for about four or five months. And boy, when she came back, all the town knew about it. She was the celebrity, boy. She was the celebrity. And somebody said, you're going to write your book? She said, uh, no, I don't think I'm going to write my book. And they said, well, what about the Laurel Literary Society? She said, I just don't care about it anymore. <laughs> and they said, why not? She said, I don't know. I just think, I think the best thing to do in life is just get folks saved and try to help them out. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's all. That's the most important thing there is to do. You take, have you been called to preach? Am I talking to some young man here tonight who's been called to preach? You know what you've been called into? You call the most valuable, permanent work a man can get called into. If the Lord took Brother Noah home tonight, his work wouldn't stop. His converts are still here. Their converts are still here. His kids are still here. The people they've led to Christ are still here. The people they're going to lead to Christ are still here. You take a lawyer, his, his work is over, you know, when he dies. He might be able to help a family out with an estate, you know, that kind of thing. And might last for one generation. Or it might even last for two generations, though. Maybe. Maybe. You take a doctor, he might be able to help one or two generations out with his work, but in two generations it's gone. My work isn't going to end two generations. Listen, ma'am, I've been a mean little old girl about 12 years old comes up and says, Brother Ruffman, I'm a chalk artist, and I'm drawing, getting people saved, and 
Bible school. I said, good, honey, you taught you to be a chalk artist. My mama, she got saved one of your meetings, and she's a chalk artist. <laughs> I got three generations. You can't show my work. I was out there one time in a place, and a guy got up, and he got up, and he said, Brother Rutten, I just want to thank God that uh, you led me to Christ, and I, I'm in the ministry now for about uh, 20 years, and I thank God that you led me to Christ. Thank God I'm saved. And at the same meeting, the guy got up right behind him and said, I just want to thank God for that preacher right there, because he led me to Christ. And right behind him, the guy got up and said, I want to thank God for that fella, because he led me to Christ. I had four generations there in one meeting. These fellows say, Ruckman don't qualify for the ministry. I don't care if I do or whether I don't. It's nothing to me. <laughs> I'm along, God bless me like, me like he does. Who cares whether I do or whether I don't? It's no, no interest to me. I say, Ruckman, why don't you resign? I resigned three times. I resigned one time in 1959. I resigned again in 1972 and resigned again in 1986. And I can't get out. <laughs> I wish some of my critics would resign and see if the Lord take them up. What's the matter, buddy? No guts? Why, you can't, you can't cut off my ministry. If you put a bullet through me right now, it wouldn't stop anything I'm doing. I mean, I've got, I'm on 43 television stations. You take those books. I've got 20,000 hours on cassette. You can't round up all them cassettes. My heresy can spread to the end of the earth. <laughs> I've got them. I don't know whether you know it or not, but right now over there in the Philippine Islands, there's a whole bunch of pastors over there getting the, their eyes open, and they're giving BBC a fit. You don't open last week and say, oh, Korea. A saved Korean who just translated the King James Bible in the Korean has just started a Bible school with 14 students, and he called it the Pensacola, <laughs> you won't believe this, he called it the Pensacola Bible Institute of C.O. Korea. What a, oh, 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 what, what, what a thing, man. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not that rabid, man. I don't, I don't get that. But you take, why, you can't, you can't shut up a preacher. I, have, I, in my lifetime, I've met converts of Billy Sunders. It goes on and on. What do you mean it's not important? You know, years ago, two little small-town actors, small-time vaudeville entertainers, were in a little town out in Kansas. And it was a rainy night, and they were going to give their little spiel in the theater there that seat about 500 people. And that night, the, the younger of the party, the younger of the comedy team, looked out between the wing of the curtain to see how the crowd was going. There was about 40 people there in the building to see about 500 people. And he said, we could take it easy tonight. And the older veteran said, why do you say that? And he said, there's only about 50 people out there. And he said to that young fellow, he said, listen, he said, the rule in this thing is always do your best, no matter how big the audience is. He said, he said why? He said, well, how do you know what's out there? There might be somebody out there just that far from suicide. There are people out there that want to laugh. They need a laugh. So this is on the same way, but it's, you know, I need a laugh, and it's your job to give them a laugh. I don't care if you preach to five people, a hundred people, a thousand people. It's still the most important work in the world. Now, you know, you know how it is with me, or maybe you don't know how it is with me. I've drawn pictures like this in Beach and Vicks Church with 4,000 people sitting there. He had to have a board eight feet square. I had to climb up on it to draw for the congregation that size. I preached at Raw in the church for 3,000 people in there and handed to the church for 3,000 people in there. And what else I've done? I've gone to the hospital and taken that paper in there and tacked it on the back end of the hospital door facing the patient and drawn that picture for one patient in one bed. Don't. Don't give me this stuff about, well, all I got get to do is preach to the jail in the old folks' home, and all I've got is a little, uh-huh, uh-huh. He who is faithful and least is faithful and much. Yeah, it's the most important work in the world. Let me ask you this. Who do you think led Jack Hiles to Christ? Let me ask you this. So, uh, Who do you think led Bob Jones Sr. to Christ? Let me ask you this. You know the name of the man who led Billy Graham to Christ? The personal worker? You know the name of the man who preached the night Spurgeon was saved?
Spurgeon was 70 years old and walked into a downtown London Methodist, independent Methodist mission. And when he walked in there with some fellow up there, he was preaching on looking to me into the earth and be saved. And there was some young preacher that couldn't handle his text and just kept repeating it. Look unto me, look unto me. And you want to be saved, look unto me. And if you want to be healed, look unto me. And if you want righteous, look unto me. And suddenly he turned to Spurgeon and said, young man, look unto me and be saved. And Spurgeon got saved right on the spot. So that fellow's name. To this day, nobody knows that fellow's name. Spurgeon doesn't even give it. But he got saved. You know what that was? Just some old two-bit, tin horn, circuit ride, Methodist preacher do what God told him to do. I heard Bob Jones see you say one time, I, I went to him one time when I was writing my thesis, and I asked him who had the most effect upon his ministry. You know what he said? He said, the man that had the most effect in my ministry was a backwoods, free will Baptist preacher named Simon Peter Richardson. Who ever heard of Simon Peter Richardson? I never did. And I said one day, I said to Bob Jones, I said, uh, how old are you when you were saved? He said, I don't directly know. He said, back in those days, he said, all those old time preachers didn't have any book learning. And all they knew was, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. Like these North Carolina preachers, you know. <laughs> I mean, the North Carolina preachers, they'll, they'll take a bunch of kids like this right here, born in this front row, and say, you're going to burn, you're going to burn, you're going to burn. <laughs> You know, you get a, nowadays they got a torch suit on you for doing that kind of stuff. If every state had preachers in like North Carolina, this country wouldn't be in the mess it's in. Put the fear of God in them, boy. We got a young fellow out of our school named Wheeler. He's from North Carolina. And he got and gave his testimony the other night. When he got and gave his testimony, he said, he said, you know, y'all talk about folks not going what, knowing whether they're going to hell or not. He said, up where I come from, everybody knows they're going to hell as soon as they're born. <laughs> <laughs> that town, one little old town with about 2,000 pre- people in it, you got 20 preachers saying you're going to hell, man. And you take that kind of stuff, that stuff, that stuff, that stuff is important. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. That's what that stuff is. Nothing more important than that. Just Simon Peter Richards. I don't know who he was. Bob Jones Sr. said, I've had brush arbor meetings out there, and he said, I think I was saved sometime before I was five years old. He said, I don't know, but he said, I can remember going home when I was five years old and screaming and crying and asked God to save me because I didn't want to burn in hell. <laughs> and the one wasn't going to give him any assurance, but he got saved. And his whole life got saved. Is it important? Let me ask you this. Do you think this, maybe this is the problem. Maybe you think tomorrow will be easier. Is that the problem? Maybe you think if I just wait till tomorrow, it'll be a little bit easier to do something. Have you found it always easier to wait till tomorrow to do something? I mean, you know the old proverb, you know, never put off tomorrow what you can do today. They asked Napoleon one time, how do you handle your mail? He said, well, I just leave it riding around for two or three weeks, and you'd be surprised how much of it isn't important after that. <laughs> I'm afraid I've handled a lot of my mail that way at times, you know. But the thing is... The grass comes up. You fellows that grow garden, is it, is it easy to get out the Johnson grass and the nut grass when it first comes up? Right it's got a good stand. Well, you know what the answer to that is. They have a joke about an old boy down in Georgia one time sitting there and they uh, sitting down on a tree doing nothing. And somebody said, what are you doing? He said, ain't much to do. He said, I'm just waiting for the crop to come in. They said, well, how's your pecans do? He said, they're all right. He said, well, he said, you pick them? He said, no cyclone came, blew them all down. They said, what to do with the brush? He said, well, lightning hit the brush fire and burn it up. They said, you're going to pick it the pecans? I don't pick them up. So the flood came along, washed them all together in one lump. He said, what you waiting for now? I said, I'm waiting for an earthquake to shake out the potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know that's not so, you see. But I mean, it's like, a, it's like a lot of folks, you know. Like a lot of folks, you know. You're going to sit around this and wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be easier. It's never easier. It's never easier. I'm you're going to come to church, you're going to come to church, and then it's too, too cold, and then it's too hot to go to church, you know, and then it's rain, and you go around, and it's just dry, you know, it's, but it's been a beautiful day, that's the day you don't go to church, that's the day you go driving. Um, you're always putting it off, and always putting it off, and the question is, are you going to wait for this tomorrow? Down south, they say, way down south, they say, manana, 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 manana. You know what the thing is wrong with manana? Manana never comes. When manana gets here, it's today. 
What are you going to do something about it? Down south, the old southerners say, I'm aiming to. Well, I'm aiming to do it. Well, I'm aiming to get ready. Well, I'm aiming. And they keep aiming. They never pull the trigger. You know, down south, we've got fellows down there, 60 and 70, 80 years old, hundreds of them. They can sing you all three standards, almost persuaded, and all four standards, just I am, and they're just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. We got fellows down there talk about the tribulation, the mark of the beast, and the antichrist, and they're just as lost as a goose in a horse race. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. When are you going to do it? I thank God I'm up getting near the end now. I'll be three score and ten here in about two weeks. And I thank God I'm up near the end. And thank God I didn't put it off. But some of you characters here, you've got to put it off right now. You haven't gone to work in the vineyard yet. When are you going to go? I like what Brother Noah said to you this morning about these, these church tramps and church hoppers. You know, there are a lot of them in this country these days. You don't want to, you don't want to be obligated. You don't want to tie yourself down. Well, if something goes wrong with the pastor, well, something might go wrong with you before it went wrong with the pastor. Um, you don't want to get attached to anything. You're worried about the gossip and connected with it. You know what you are? You are a, you are a gutless, egotist man. You think you're so good, you can't put yourself under the authority of a preacher. You know so much Bible, you can't let anybody bear rule over you. You're so independent, you're independent of God, man. And don't ever kid yourself about your usefulness. Every useful Christian, that Bible is connected with the local church. You can't find a one of them just running around loose. Not even Paul. He's got more connected with more than the rest of them are. You take that kind of stuff. When are you going to get to work? I mean, get get laboring. And it's getting quiet here again. I've done quit preaching, gone to middle, but I know these people. I'm, 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 listen, I'm no spring chicken man. I have no illusions about life. You couldn't shock me with a shocking machine. There are people all this country get my tapes and sit around and listen to them 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 and never do a cotton picking thing for the Lord except argue with people about what they heard over them tapes. We have them all the time. They won't come down and go to school down there. They don't they come down and go to that school, they'll get the mark of the beast on them, boy. So they sit up there, you know, and listen. The young man that's been I'm talking to right now, I'm going to tell you something. You can't know what I know if you want to know it. And you can't learn what I've learned if you want to learn it by sitting around listening to tapes and reading books. You know why you can't? Because that isn't how I learned it. I run out there in the field, dealing with people and praying with people and witness with people and talking with people and going to the hospital and marrying them and burying them. And deal with the problems. I didn't get all that stuff sitting around in a, in a, in a, in a uh, room someplace reading the book and listening to tapes. Well, well, well. Let me ask you this. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you haven't been asked. You reckon that's it? Uh, maybe the problem is nobody's asked you to work. Has anybody asked you to work? You say, no, brother, I haven't been asked. Well, I'm going to ask you right now. <laughs> Will you go to work in my vineyard? Well, let me ask you again right this. Why stand ye idle all day? Why stand idle all day? You want to get to work? My people down in Brent Baptist Church in Pensacola, one of them said to me one time, said, well, Brother Ruckman, he said, uh, they said, you know, you're not very inspirational when it comes to soul winning. They said, you're not a very good motivator for soul winning, and that's why some of us older folks don't win souls. So I thought myself, uh-huh. So I had Lester Roloff come in for a meeting, and I had Bill Rice come in for a meeting, and I had Bob Gray come in for a meeting. And I had a couple more come in for a meeting, and they still didn't win souls. Amen. You old hypocrites, you. It ain't Ruckman. It's the things you've been asked, and you haven't gone. Son, go to work today in my vineyard. I go, sir, and you ain't gone. The Lord said to Paul one time, and he said, uh, Rise and stand upon your feet, and go to the city to be sure you what you tell what you're going to do. You know what Paul told uh, Agrippa? He said, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Paul was asked to go to work, and he went to work. Amen. You know what Isaiah did? He said, Here am I, Lord, send me. Those fellows, they didn't turn the thing down, was offered to them. They were asked, and they went. Maybe it's excuses. All excuses. Tramp knocked time one time at the door of a lady out in the country, and 
said, uh, ma'am, he said, uh, you got a meal for a hungry old bum? And she said, you see that there pile of wood over there? <laughs> and he took one look at it and said, no, I never seen it. <laughs> and she said, I saw you seen it. <laughs> he said, you may have saw me see it, but you ain't going to see me saw it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> now listen, if you have never been asked, you're going to get asked now. And the question is, why stand here idle all day long? Excuses, excuses, excuses. People think of excuses, they're never any good. They're never any good. You know, you know what Lincoln said to McClellan one time, back in the Civil War? He said to McClellan, he said, I can't understand where they get all those troops from. They got two million troops. And McClellan said, they don't have two million troops. And President Lincoln said, they must have, because every time you have a battle with them, you say they got an outnumbered ten to one, we only got 200,000 troops. <laughs> they must have two million. Alibis. Alibis. My favorite alibi is a little boy that played hooky from school, and he phones up the principal and says, Jimmy can't come to school today. And, and, and the, from the principal said, the school says, who's this talking? And he says, I'm his daddy. <laughs> that just blows it, ma'am. Listen, you haven't got one excuse for not picking up the hoe, the pickaxe, and the shovel, and go out and get to work. You saw I'm 50. Moses is 80. You saw I'm handicapped. So is the blind man. So is the crippled man. You saw I'm a little girl. So is the one in the second king of chapter 5. You saw I'm a little boy. It's in John chapter 6. You don't have any alibis. Let me ask you this. Maybe this is the real trouble. Maybe the trouble is you think God's going to excuse you. You reckon that? You reckon God's going to let you off the hook and not going to require of you? You reckon it's just Ruckman and Noe, you know, and Utley, you know, and, and Lentz, you know, that are at you and yelling at you and screaming at you and hollering you and trying to get you in gear. It's just a bunch of preachers don't have your best interests at heart. You reckon that's what it is? Will God excuse you? You know, you've got time for television. You've got time for your family. You got time for your sports. You got time for hunting. Some of you got time for fishing. You don't have any time to labor in the vineyard. Excuse, excuse, excuses. You think God will excuse you? So that everyone ever should give kind of himself to God. I read my Bible one time over in Proverbs where it says, If you forbear to deliver those that are drawn to death, if you say, Behold, we knew it not, but not he that ponders your heart consider it. And not he that keeps your soul does he not know it, and shall not rend every man according to his works. That thing say, if you say we don't know these unsaved people are unsaved, if you go around and say we didn't realize the condition they were in, he says, the one that keeps your soul, doesn't he know it? Doesn't he know they're going to hell? And doesn't he know you know it? Yes, he does. And shall not render every man according to his works. Yes, he will. Why stand you here all day? Idle. Go to work in my vineyard. Ah, uh, it's getting now near the twilight uh, time for some of you, and you haven't gone yet. And maybe nothing I'm going to say to you, you want to stick with you, I don't know. But like I said, there's no satisfaction in life like getting near the end of the thing and looking back and seeing the time you spent in the right kind of service and the right army fighting the right kind of face. Well, no, he's up in years now, and Brother Noah never had a whole lot of experience out there living like the devil in the same when he was a young man. And thank God he did it. Thank God he did it. But maybe he doesn't know really how, how blessed it is compared to the life of an unsaved person. You know, the best time to get saved when you're about five years old. And then get sold out to God when you're ten. And then go into full-time service when you're twelve. <laughs> That's the best thing to do if you can do it. But I couldn't do it. I had to come up the other way. And us old dogs got dragged out of hell by the back of our neck. We only have one advantage over you clean living folks. Only one. You've got all the advantages. We just have one. And that's we attend to appreciate salvation a little bit better than you do. That's the only difference. Outside of that, you've got all the advantages. Bob Jones Sr. never drank or smoked today in his life. He had all the advantages. You don't have, you don't have to fight against old habits and thoughts some of us got up. 
Some of us had to fight with a, with a, with a bear and a monkey on our back for, for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. I've paid for stuff in the last five years I sold before I was 23 years old. The best thing to do is come up clean and get saved clean and live clean and go the whole way. If you can do it. If you can do it. But you think, well, up knowing the twilight years of his life, I'm sure he knows, I'm sure he appreciates what God has given to do, and I'm sure he knows it's been a good life. I'll tell you, I know it. It's been a great life. You couldn't, you couldn't get me to give up if you came to me, literally, with five million bucks in cash, you Yankee, and put that thing down there, literally, you couldn't get me to give back the years that I've spent for Jesus Christ. You haven't got the money to buy. Down there in my Pensacola floor, and I had a bunch of my brethren who wanted to uh, buy me along a certain situation. They wanted me to compromise about a certain situation, which I would not compromise on. They decided to buy me off by giving me some royalties in my books. I'd never taken royalty on my books. I don't take any royalties now. But they figured if they'd uh, give me some back royalties in my books, I'd be converted to their way of thinking. So they voted to give me $50,000 in, in back royalties for my books for 17 years. And they gave it to me. You know how long I had that money? I had the money for four weeks. He said, what'd you do? I gave every cop, pick a cent of it away, but $1,700. <laughs> And I wasn't converted to that point of view either. Amen. You say what? Well, you can't buy me. Amen. I mean, there may be some things about me, I'll, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you something about Ruckman. There's there are three three things he ain't going to steal from you. He's not going to steal your wife from you, and not going to steal your time from you, and not going to steal your Bible from you. Amen. You can't buy me. With all the money in the world. You couldn't buy me for three minutes. You say, well, just because you're hard-headed. Okay, I'm hard-headed. You still can't buy me. You take that kind of stuff, they're looking back across that thing. I wouldn't take the years I've had for Jesus Christ for anything. That's the most precious thing I've got. There's 42 years on the right side with the right army. There mocked his hand. <laughs> yes, sir, brother. He said, fight the good fight of faith. And you know, I, uh, I collect the testimony of these old fellows like me, these old rough, mean, nasty fellows that got saved and got pulled out of hell. And I collect those because that's my crew. I know them. And it isn't because I'm trying to glamorize sin. And it's not because I'm trying to make sin look attractive, because sin is not attractive. And I'm trying to make it look like you have to go through all these things to know what you're talking about, because you don't. Uh, uh, Paul said to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. And Timothy was clean as a hound's too. So you don't have to go through those things, but I, I take delight in, in picking up the testimony of these old fellows, old reprobates, because that's my crew. <laughs> and one of my favorites, an old boy, an old gangster named George Myers. He was born in 1909. I don't know if he's still alive right now, but if he's alive right now, he'd live a long time. <laughs> I think he died somewhere about 1983. But you think George Myers was Al Capone chauffeur. They call him the devil. And George Myers was raised in Champaign, Illinois. And his uh, mother and daddy got divorced. His grandmother raised him, and he went to Chicago, and he got a reputation for a fast driver. He could handle a car. And Al Capone hired him at $300 a week. And let me tell you something, man. $300 a week in the Depression was some moolah. <laughs> that was some Iron Man. But he wasn't satisfied. He wanted $1,000 a week. And he went to Nitty, you know, uh, Capone's buddy, and Nitty. Frank Nitty said, I'll get it for you. But when the razors came around, the money went to Pachetti, one of Capone's cousins. And Nitty said, well, you know, he said, George, the swellies have to come first. And George Myers got uh, upset with Al Capone. He hit one of his pay stations and took $186,000 out of it. That was a week's pay out of one of those pay stations in Chicago, $180,000, bucks, man. And took that money and hit out for Pittsburgh. And old Al, Al got smiling, Al got a contract on him. And George had to go hide in a, in a, in a cat house in Pittsburgh. He lay around that cat house for a couple of months and finally Al Capone wrote him and forgave him and said, I'll forgive you if you go to work for, uh, Owen Madden over in New Jersey. So uh, George goes over to Owen Madden, New Jersey, goes to work for him robbing banks and robbing payrolls and robbing armored trucks, picks him $130,000 and the police get after him. He runs down to Monta Bale. This happened. I'm not giving you a Hollywood scenario. This is in a soap opera. This guy is real. 
and he goes down to Montevideo, and a police, uh, police, uh, a uh, captain named uh, Fitzgerald went down to Mount of after him and kidnapped him. <laughs> and brought him back to the States and threw him in the clink. Went to Alcatraz. And he got in there with Willie Sutton. The two of them tried to escape through the sewer and liked to drown the sewer when they flooded the sewer. And he was there with Al Capone, you know, Machine Gun Kelly and that bunch. Then they put him in Sing Sing for about two years. And finally a lawyer got him out because he proved that Tom Fitzgerald didn't have any right to go down to Mount of and get him. So he got back out. When he got back out, he decided to pretend like he was going straight. And he married a Christian woman, a saved girl in, uh, in Texas, about 1935. And that saved girl, she witnessed to him, and he went and joined the church without getting saved and acted like he was a Christian when he wasn't. Then he decided to go into hotel business. And he got in the hotel business, put him up a hotel, and the first thing he did was get a bunch of call girls. And he got a bunch of call girls working in the, in the, in the hotel, and he got one of them, he got shacking up with her, a girl named Melvis, Mount Malvis, and she was about ten years younger than his wife, so it was kind of flattering to him, you know. And his wife found out about it, and they had a big blowout in the family, and she told him to get out. And he got mad, got in the car, and ran up to Chicago, and got up there, and got Ramadi in a poker game, and won about $7,000 in a poker game, and the guy wouldn't pay him, and he threatened the guy, and the guy wouldn't pay him. And finally wrote him through the mail and threatened him in the mail and said, you have that money at a drop off of such and such a place or you're gone. And he said, I'm going to get this money and go back to Texas and try to make things right with my wife. She prayed for him the whole time. <laughs> I mean, these are my boys, you see. And this fellow gets up there and he wins the 7000 bucks. The guy don't pay. He goes to drop off and the money's there. He puts a $7,000 suitcase. Heads out in the souped up Plymouth and heads down for Champaign, Illinois. He gets about halfway out of Chicago. Here come the thugs. And I'm in a souped up Plymouth, 70, 80. And I mean, just like you see it in the movies now. I mean, 90 with <laughs> shooting out the gas tank, trying to hit the tires. And 110, they hit that old boy. And he goes off the road and that thing goes over about 15 times out in the field. And they pick him up unconscious. And George said the last thing he remembers was a flashlight in his face and two guys looking at him. And one of them say, this S.O.B. is bleeding like blankety blank. And he thought it was this, this guy's buddies coming to get the money back, but it was the FBI. They put him in Leavenworth. They got him in Leavenworth for using extortion through the mail. And they got him in Leavenworth and put him there in a, in a, in a cell. And they put him in a cell with a guy named Dutch. And Dutch was about half crazy. He'd had a 357 Magnum blow out one ear and one eye and part of his brain. And he was a wild looking character with one eye, but he was saved. And he was born again. You know what George Meyer said? He said, I never looked at Dutch without the peculiar feeling that, that he looked like a man who just made a prison break. <laughs> See, if the sun shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And, one day, George says to him, you going to chapel this morning? Or Dutch says, you going to chapel this morning, George? George says, blank to blank, no. He said, why don't you come on to chapel and bring your Bible? Where would you get that Bible from? And George said, my wife sent it to me. He said, you sure must have a good wife. George sent you a Bible. Oh, blank to blank, I never read it. And after about two weeks, that one day they're talking. He says to George, he says, uh, he says uh, why don't you come on to chapel this morning? George says, I don't ask God for no favors. Said, uh, he never done any for me, and I ain't doing any for him. I'm master of my own life. I give myself the breaks. And Dutch laughed at him and said, George, you're a D blank fool. So how do you figure? He said, is this one of the breaks you gave yourself getting here the slammer? <laughs> and George said, well, he said, how about you? You're in. And Dutch laughed at him, and he winked at him with that one eye and said, yeah, but I ain't on the devil's payroll anymore, George. Walked out the door. <laughs> and the next Sunday, George went to chapel with him. And he went to chapel with him, and Dutch had to carry his Bible for him. He was ashamed to carry it. And they got there, and the pastor and the chaplain, the prison evangelist, preached on Romans 1. And boy, George said he sat there with his head down, was so terrible he couldn't listen. And they got back and got back in the cell and got back there, and George suddenly turned to Dutch and said, Dutch, he said, Are you born again? And Dutch said, I sure am. And he said, well, I'm not. And George said, well, go run. And Dutch said, well, go run what that meaneth. <laughs> Walked out the cell. You know what George said? He was running the prison elevator, Fort Leavenworth. He said, I got in the elevator and ran the elevator down in the basement. And he said, well, I was down there. 
He said, I ran it up and stomped between the floors and turned off the lights and got on my knees in that elevator. He said, I know what happened to me, but I know I got up a new man. And he got up and they got him out of Leavenworth, got him back to Texas near his wife, and he got out and the wound up with a happy ending. He got out and he did join the church and he did get baptized. And you say, man, now if he's alive, if he's dead, he's in glory. But you take George when he was 70, 70. He walked out of that little Texas Baptist church there with his Bible in his arm. And he met a little old Indian Mexican boy there about 14 years old. And the little old boy said, hey, mister, I see you got a Bible. And George said, yeah, yeah, I got me a Bible. The Indian boy said, you read yours through yet? And George said, uh, no, no, I haven't read it through yet. The little boy said, I read mine through. He said, what, what's taking you so long? You know what George said? He said he went home and cried for the first time in 53 years. And just bawled like a baby. You know what he's crying about? 70 years just shot. Where he could have been in the field getting something done. Seven years gone. Go to work today in my vineyard. All right, Father, we ask you to bless upon the Word of God tonight. The Holy Spirit wrote this book. We pray to confirm it, and especially these Christians here tonight. For somebody here, you wanted the vineyard. You want laborers. You said the, the, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And we need some young man here tonight to say, Sir, I go. And then get up and go. And not say, Sir, I go and go not. And Lord, I know you give them what they're worth. I, I don't feel the least bit skinned or gypped or cheated, Lord. Not the least. The only complaint I have to make, Father, is about my own sins. I have no complaint to make about the pay. I have no complaint to make about the service, Lord. Absolutely none. Lord, you've been more than liberal with me and more than generous with me. And I'm, I'm, I'm here before thee tonight, Lord. I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm, I'm one of those special ones, one of those spoiled children of yours, Lord, one of those favorites that just got breaks that, that I didn't deserve and didn't earn and not entitled to. I'm very, I'm very aware of this. And Lord, I just want to testify to these people that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And Lord, I wouldn't trade for anything. And I'm so glad, Lord. I'm so glad I got him 42 years. I'm so glad. I didn't think it'd be half that many. And I'm so glad. And I pray somebody else here in the closing years of this dispensation, maybe our count is wrong, Lord. Maybe you're not going to be here for 20, 30 more years. I don't know. Nobody knows. But Lord, I pray somebody tonight will pick up the shovel, the shovel and the hole and the pickaxe or the rake or whatever and get out in the fields. Let's pray a while. Let's pray a while. Have the musicians play. Like that woman just play something for us, piano player. I know we're looking around for a while. God was spirit. You're not going to see him looking around. If your mind's wandering, try to get your mind for a while, what we're talking about. Let me ask you something. Are you in the harvest field? Are you ever going to get there? Are you just going to spend the rest of your life just messing around? I thank God you go to church. The more you ought to go to church and do. You probably ought to go more often you do. But is that all you're going to do? You're never going to get to work. You're not going to come to the pastor and say, Pastor, is there something I can do? You're not going to come to the pastor and say, Brother Noe, is there anything around here I can do that you need to have done? I want to do it for Christ. It may not be a call to preach. 